as D.A. Willis took the stand for the first time in Georgia. If you turned on any news channel, any cable news channel, you would have seen the exact same thing. This is one of those big news events that there was no disagreement about across this channel you're watching and the other one, CNN, and that other one, Fox Media. All of them carried a large part of this live because this was a huge deal to see the effort to disqualify her culminate in her taking the stand today. I'm going to walk through with you what happened. There is no simple or single headline. This is a story, and I'll explain why, where both things can be true. There can be a rather ridiculous, tendentious, almost harassing level of legalistic personal attacks on this person in power, this DA. And there can also be evidence that has now come to light that has been a bit of a setback or more for her office and thus the RICO case. Both those things happen to be true tonight. Now, all of this started with what was a long shot filing, not even by defendant Trump, but by one of his co-defendants to try to find any muck, mess, smear or conflict on the part of the prosecutor. And if you follow cases, you watch the news, maybe you do, you may know that it's a rare thing indeed for those things to work. There were the similar type uh, questions and innuendo raised about Bob Mueller. People have argued maybe Jack Smith is a conflict. Those things don't usually get very far. And removing a prosecutor is very rare. But this got further along because of evidence that emerged. And then today, a series of witnesses raised the heat even more. And that is what led to then what we saw this afternoon. Because of testimony about the alleged, I say alleged possible conflict stemming from a relationship, a romance between D.A. Willis and prosecutor Nathan Wade, the evidence came in. There were allegations by at least one individual that her timeline was not 100 percent accurate. And D.A. Willis made a surprise snap decision to get on the stand where she was very firm and at times heated in explaining everything. I probably had some choice words about some of the things that you said that were dishonest within this motion. So I don't know that it was a conversation. As you know, Mr. Wade is a Southern gentleman. Me, not so much. Ms. Willis should be treated hostile. I think we well, have. I very much want to be here, so I'm not a hostile witness. I very much want to be not here. So you tried to implicate I slept with him at that conference, which I find to be extremely offensive. Or it's highly offensive when someone lies on you, and it's highly offensive when they the try judge. to implicate that you slept with somebody the first day you met with them. I object to you getting records. You've been intrusive into people's personal lives. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. Has he ever visited you at the place you laid your head? So let's be clear, because you've lied in this, this. Let me tell you which one you lied in. Right here. I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. This is the truth. Judge, and this it, is, it, it is a lie. It is, it is a lie. This is a lie. That was the DA there speaking, gesturing under oath, going back at both the co-counsel and the Trump defense lawyer, Stephen Sada, who also questioned her today, which itself is rare, only because this motion has gotten this far. Uh, she was deliberately combative. She was clearly emotive because she was expressing herself, and she kind of made that clear. Hey, I'm here. I'm now taking the questions. She didn't rely on what she could have legally, which were efforts to uh, basically object to her having to testify at all as the sitting DA in this case. Uh, she accused the people there of the false allegations. I want to play that part again because this got so heated. Again, you may say, okay, Ari, are you making a big deal out of this? No, this moment got so heated that right afterward, the judge actually had everybody take a five-minute break. This was that dramatic pushback. So let's be clear because you've lied in this, this. Let me tell you which one you lied in right here. I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. no. This is the truth, judge. And this it, is, it, it is a lie. It is, it is a lie. Right. A lie. As I mentioned, the judge then broke for five minutes, tried to get everyone back on track. But the legal issue here was lawyers basically trying to make an argument that this relationship, which has been acknowledged and which is between D.A. Willis and one of the prosecutors who was appointed to be a, a kind of a special prosecutor, a special appointee on the case, that the timeline of their romance, that's the legal issue being explored, somehow uh, has not been accurately provided for and that that could inform what the defense lawyers say would be a conflict. And this meant there was a bunch of testimony about when it started and when it ended. When did your romantic relationship with Mr. Wade end? My did it end? Me and Mr. Wade, um, we are good friends. Uh, 
my respect for him has grown over these seven weeks of attacks. Well, Could we just have an answer to the question? I'm, I can handle this, say that. Let's he, have it. She asked about a personal relationship. She asked when the romantic relationship ended. That's the question. It sometime in, um, I'd say late summer of 2023. So I don't believe me in, um, so this is what you're really asking about. This is the salaciousness of all of this, right? The questions then also explored and pressed on when this same relationship started. How often did Mr. Wade visit you at a place where you were living between 2019 and 2021? So you want to start with the lie that he lived with me in, in South Fulton in 2019, the home he's never been to? That's one lie you told in your document. While we're talking about professionalism, she put in three different documents well, he lived with me. Full opportunity to respond. He has never been to my residence in 2019, ever, not once. Let me help you out. I lived there in 2020. He never came to my house in 2020, let alone live with me. Your testimony, there was no romantic relationship with Mr. Wade until early in 2022, whether it be January or February or March, early in 2022, correct? I would say sometime between February and April. So that's the timeline. Again, to pull back from what the DA called the salaciousness, the timeline could matter legally if the judge determines that the findings or the evidence suggests the relationship was earlier than stated, uh, and that somehow affects how this prosecutor on this high profile case against the former president and others, how that prosecutor was brought into the case and whether that is a big enough conflict combined with some other questions about money that we'll get to uh, to disqualify the D.A. Now, how did this go down today? If this was scheduled, if we knew this was going to happen, we might have mentioned it yesterday. You might have read about it. You might have gotten a phone alert, big testimony coming tomorrow or next week. This was a surprise move. And best we can tell from the chain of events Willis and her office went from a plan not to testify today, objecting to her having to testify, and then shifting to her coming out and saying, no, I got it, I'm going to deal with this. And best we can tell, it was in part a response to what was a potentially negative witness for the DA's office who spoke out today. Now, as with all court processes, I'm just going to give you the facts and the evidence. You're going to see what this person said. It doesn't mean we know who is telling the full truth or not. But it certainly added legal heat on Willis. So this is what is being described as a former friend, or you could call it someone she knew, who testified that, under oath, her view and what she observed meant that the relationship started earlier, back in 2019. You have no doubt that their romantic relationship was in effect from 2019 until the last time you spoke with her? No doubt. Did you observe them do things that are... Uh, in common among people having a romantic relationship? Yes. Such as, can you give us an example? Hugging, kissing, disaffection. All, of, all before November 1st of 2021, correct? Yes. Now, that is her testimony, and it contradicts or is basically in complete tension with the sworn affidavit submitted by D.A. Willis and Prosecutor Wade. And now that you've seen D.A. Willis testify today, she doubled down on that in her comments under oath. So there is a problem here in that we have different accounts and they can't all be true. Wade testified the romantic relationship began in 2022 and he discussed their travels together. When did your romantic relationship with Ms. Willis begin? 2022. Did you go with D.A. Willis to Aruba in 2022? I did. Thank you. <coughs> and you paid for that trip using your business credit card, correct? I did. They went back and forth on a lot of details that we don't have to show you in full about the finances, about the money, the discussion of cash. I'll show you a little bit more on that later because the defense lawyers are trying to make uh, some kind of argument that beyond the potential misstatement or false testimony, which, again, hasn't been proven, but that beyond that, they also want to argue that there might be some sort of financial misconduct here. All of this, of course, is about something larger. None of this would be 
under discussion if there wasn't a racketeering indictment against the former president and many of his aides, some of whom already confessed and pled out because of an illegal plot to steal the election, which focused on Georgia, among other places. And we're speaking about this at a time where, as mentioned, Donald Trump also awaits a reckoning in New York for a criminal trial that involves alleged election misconduct in a different election, the original one of his first time getting to the White House, 2016, and Jack Smith's coup case, where we learned late today the Trump folks have filed their response to Jack Smith, and they are going back and forth over the timing and the immunities that the Trump folks think they have, even though they've lost two rounds on that. But what happened today in Georgia is, as mentioned, the most significant and, frankly, most chaotic day uh, since at least those other convictions I mentioned, if not since the big indictment first dropped. And while much of the pressure and the complaints and the questions that the Trump side are launching at the DA don't seem to pile up to that much, especially if you use a Trump standard of everything he's done, admitted to, and been accused of, but not just that, they don't necessarily pile up to a clear legal conflict of interest that would strike a prosecutor, which, as mentioned, is a rare thing indeed to do. And yet, on the other hand, what we need to get into tonight is, how is this happening and how does this actually affect the case? Number one, does it make it more likely that this DA would be disqualified legally? That's a question for the judge, and it's a big question on a case of this magnitude, because there are some problems and some heat. There is a reason she chose to make a surprise move and testify, and it wasn't because things were going perfectly. And then two, when we do deal with something we've been hearing about for years now, what would it mean as a nation to put a former president on trial to assure the fairness and seriousness of that project? How do Americans who, quite frankly, might not be like you watching the news or like me pouring over legal briefs. How does everyone else perceive and understand what's happening there to maintain the credibility of a RICO case that already has convictions and has high stakes if it ever is going to involve the trying of defendant Donald Trump? When you meet my father, he's going to tell you as a woman, you should always have, which I don't have, so let's don't tell him that. You should have at least six months in cash at your house at all times. No, sir, she didn't go to the ATM. She carried the cash. For many, many years, I have kept money in my house. That money in my worst days has probably only been $500 or $1,000. At my best days, I probably had $15,000 in my house. So you have no proof of any reimbursement for any of these things because it was all cash, right? The proof is what I just told you. That was the cash discussion. As promised, I want to bring in a very special guest for our Georgia coverage tonight. Manny Aurora was a defense lawyer to defendant Kenneth Chisborough during his past Georgia RICO trial. He has extensive experience both in this very set of cases as well as more broadly uh, how Georgia cases work. Um, you're busy. A lot going on today. I appreciate you joining us, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, same question to you that Maya and I were just discussing. Did, the, did these defense counsel move the ball on disqualification inside the courtroom here this week? I think you have to look at it from the perspective of which defendants you're talking about. Jack Smith's case, for example, in the federal situation said that the electors in Georgia were sort of duped or schmucks, didn't know what was going on, and therefore they weren't going to be charged, and that was specifically listed in his indictment. In this case, they were charged by Fonnie Willis, which is in contrast to the federal court. So if I'm one of their lawyers, like Ashley Merchant or somebody else, I would certainly argue that the fact that you hired your boyfriend to handle this stuff, paid him, probably it's gotten close to a million dollars at this point, um, and taken as long as it's taken. It's one of the longest, if not the longest, special grand jury in the history of our state, and then indicted all the people that the feds had looked into it for years more than you had. There's a question there to be had, and it, to me, it doesn't matter if she got a kickback or a free vacation. Emotionally, if you're giving somebody that's not qualified to do a job, a job and paying them this kind of money, that to me stinks to high heaven. And I don't think that's appropriate. Is that is that a yes? Yes, I think they made some progress. But the problem is a lot no. of the witnesses that they anticipated testifying, I think, are getting scared off and everybody's sort of fighting the subpoenas. And we learned earlier in the week some of the Confederates for the D.A. had called out to Terrence Bradley and some of the others giving him advice on what they think he should do. And if I would have done that, or if your other guests would have done that, we'd all be indicted and under the jail at this point already. So, uh, yeah, I have a lot of problems with things that are going on. And the fact that one witness actually had the courage to go forward and say this is what she saw in the office, 
Uh, there should be about half a dozen more on the witness list that would do that, but I don't know if they're actually going to come Let's through. Let's slow you down. Mm -hmm. Let's slow you down and clarify you. What you're saying is you, your view is that uh, there was some sort of coordination of testimony, and that was coming from the DA side as they try to defend this issue. And you're saying that's the very kind of thing that, not specific to this DA, but prosecutors in general, go after. That's what you're saying. Well, that's what we learned on the court hearing on Monday or Tuesday, whatever it was, with another witness that was out there. I think Ms. Merchant got him to establish that, yes, I, in fact, called Terrence Bradley, their star witness, as a, quote, fraternity brother, even though they're a decade in age apart, and advised him that he should think about the attorney-client privilege before he testifies. Those are those little kind of hints, and along with the fact that other folks have mentioned that they may have gotten calls, there's a pressure to these folks. That's why everybody's you know, raising motions to quash. There are consequences to lawyers that would go in there because you have to deal with these people on a daily basis for all your other clients, and you're not going to get the deals that you think you're going to get if you cross the DA. And I've known Ms. Right. Willis. And that's I don't have any problem with her. Yeah, and I, I'm going to jump back in, sir. I mean, you're, yes, you're speaking to what's also a complicated scenario when uh, these kind of motions are flying at the DA's office while they're trying to do their work, and you're mentioning, of course, the authorities they have. I'm only going to keep us moving because I have other highlights to discuss, and then I'm going to have Maya respond as well. Um, but when you mentioned the idea that maybe there was, again, discussions about testimony, um, you know, we have some of this discussion where, uh, faced with questions about timing, um, you have certain answers from Wade and Willis. I'm, not, I'm only going to show it. I'm not going to pre-describe it. But, but let's take a look on uh, what was discussed at one point about uh, the gender uh, of the person doing the remembering. Forgive me. I'm a, I'm a man. We don't do the date thing. He's a man. He probably would say June or July. I would say we had a tough conversation in August. The okay. physical relationship ended pre-indictment. I'm sure if you ask Mr. Wade, because he's a male, he would say we ended June or July because physical contact ended then. Just in my mind, being a woman, it's over when you have that, like, hard conversation. That's, I just think women and men think differently. Uh, Manny, what did you think of that testimony about the ending? I really don't have a perspective on it. I, I don't care. My whole issue is why did you hire the person you hired? Why did you pay him so much money when you've got a staff of seven other lawyers sitting behind you, including the guy that wrote the Georgia Rico book that you brought on a special counsel? You've got more special counsel. Let me slow you down again. And I don't mean... I don't mean to interject too much. I'm not going to I'm trying not to turn this into a, a reboot of, of the fiery testimony this afternoon. But just to be clear, the lawyers for the Trump co-defendants, they did seem to think the ending mattered, the ending of this relationship. You're saying with regard to the disqualif disqualification doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter if it started either prior to or during if the person was hired. There's, I think, bigger questions that we're dancing around. As we learned this morning, there were several other witnesses that they expected to have come in. People have moved to quash subpoenas. Some people have decided they're going to assert attorney-client privilege from cases from three, four, five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gotten into a lot of bizarro-type mm -hmm. issues in this case as far as that goes, um, including the judge having to say, look, just because you talk to somebody doesn't make it attorney-client because they hired you for a reason. You can go have dinner with them, and it's not attorney-client. And so their objections are flying fast and furious. And my whole position is, look, if you didn't do anything wrong, which is what the prosecution usually tells us, then just tell us everything. Give us the records. What's the issue? Why are we having this? Just come clean. Okay. Instead, we're okay. doing the Maya, let me, thing. I, I, I went to you a couple times. Lying. Yep. Uh, uh, Maya? Well, I'm hearing a lot of allegations. I certainly think if there's any evidence of wrongdoing, it's incredibly important to get underneath that. All I know right now is allegations about this, and I have no personal information or others about it. But let me just go back to the point. I mean, the issue here is whether or not there is evidence that supports that there is a prosecution happening here that should not be because of some impermissible reason, some personal interest. I do think it is incredibly important to remember there's a difference between an ethics law violation or a criminal violation if you're misusing your office and your power, and whether or not it is prejudicial to the defendants in terms of what is being alleged or charged. And I think that remains the question.